Um, thanks everyone for coming here today um, to hear Zach Goldsmith yeah. speak to the Oxford Guild Business Society and the Oxford Conservative Association. Um, we're very fortunate to have Zach here today. Um, just to give you a little brief background, I'm sure you already uh, don't need an introduction, but Zach's been MP for Richmond Park since 2010. He's also been an environmental uh, journalist and a role player. And the format today is we're going to have Zach talk for a few minutes um, just about his life, his experiences, and then we're going to open up to the floor for some Q&A. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Um, so I, I've come unprepared in the sense that I don't, didn't really know what, what, to, um, what topic to cover. So I'm going to just say a few things, speak very briefly, and if you want to butt in at any time, please do, and then we'll, I will leave it as open as possible and as much time as possible for a discussion. So you can set the agenda, you can take it in, in whatever direction you want. And I'll talk a little bit about, about Parliament, about politics, given that at least half of you here are interested in politics, and I assume the other half have a vague interest in politics. I, I have always been interested in politics. I've only been formally involved. I've only been an MP now for two and a half years. And when I was campaigning, and even before I was campaigning, I was as cynical as anyone else is about the political system. I mean, I, 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 I looked on the outside, I looked at it, and as far as I was concerned, it really it looked as though it... What was it? Past, I forget the correct term, but it stinks from the outside. And that's the impression you get from me. You turn on any radio station at any time, no who you're listening to, the moment the word politics comes into it, the whole machine fizzes with rage. It's almost mandatory now to despise politicians. Well, I started from that perspective two or three years ago. Having got into politics, all my cynicism has, as far as I'm concerned, been authenticated, been justified. I'm more cynical now than I was when I went in. And, um, and, and there, are, there are a lot of reasons, not just because it's an odd place, it is an odd, I'm sure this is a very odd place. I didn't go here and I don't know how it works here, but I'm, I'm sure there are some similarities. But it is an odd place, Parliament. There are lots of customs. There's no rule book. You, know, you just turn up and you just have to figure it out. So you stumble around shaking people's hands, and that's an insult. First thing you can't do. You're not allowed to shake hands with an MP if you're an MP because you're implying that they're not honourable. You shake hands historically to show you're not armed. And if you shake hands, people take this very seriously in Parliament. If you shake hands with an MP, there is an implication there that the honourable gentleman might not be honourable, and therefore you know, you're, you're insulting them. And they're on it. And there are a number of people who take it very seriously. It, it's a, um, it, it's, you can't take part in debates. You can't do any, have any kind of engagement in the main chamber until you deliver your, your maiden speech. Now, you know, again, it's probably similar to some of the formats you have here, but, and I've given thousands of, I'm exaggerating, hundreds of speeches, but there's nothing like speaking in Parliament. It's a very unsettling thing. And your maiden speech, the first time you open your mouth in Parliament, in the chamber, when you introduce yourself to the chamber, you explain what kind of MP you're going to be, you talk about your priorities. You have to do that before you can even ask one question of the minister. Well, I wanted to get mine over with. A lot of people waited six months <coughs> before doing theirs just to kind of soak up the atmosphere. I wanted to get it done within the first few weeks because I had an issue coming out which I wanted to debate. And I was really nervous and I went outside and I sat on a, a kind of low flint wall outside Port Palace House and I was smoking. And in those days I was a chain smoker, not anymore as of yesterday. Um, and, I sat there and, um, and I thought, what am I going to say? And I was making notes. And then time went by. I realized I had eight minutes left before I had to give my speech, which is more or less the distance it takes together. So I jumped off the wall, and my trousers caught a little bit of flint, and it ripped a hole. And it wasn't a little scratch. It was like a cat flap in the back of my trousers. And I didn't know anyone there, so I couldn't borrow any trousers. I'm sure people swap trousers all the time in Parliament for all kinds of reasons, but I didn't know anyone at the time, and I couldn't ask. So I had to go like a crab with my back to the wall, all the way around the buildings until I got to the main chamber and delivered my first speech in the chamber, pressed up against the wall so that no one could see that a basic there wasn't wearing any trousers. But I more or less pulled it on. Perhaps, you know, it could well go down as one of the most boring maiden speeches in history, but nevertheless, I did it and I was able to take part in the debate. It's a very, very disconcerting odd place. But that is not the reason why my cynicism was was nurtured or authenticated or justified. The truth is, it is a totally, it is a totally dysfunctional system. Uh, uh, we talk about uh, our democracy, and on paper, and in a sense, of course, we have the, you know, democracy, I can be booted out in a couple of years' time. Uh, it's a marginal seat, based on what happened last night in East I probably will get booted out in a couple of years' time. Um, but it's, it's not a functioning democracy, and there are a few reasons for that. If you, if you had to crystallize the job of an MP, if you created a job description for an MP, there is no job description, but if there was, it would, or at least it should, say that your job is to hold the government to account on behalf of the constituents. That's basically it. Everything else is ancillary. Cutting ribbons, and 
everything else, it's all ancillary. The key thing is holding the government to account on behalf of the people who sent you to Parliament. And that's it. But the trouble is we have no separation of power in this country, as you know. Uh, if you want to join the government, you're plucked from the back benches by the government. You become a minister, your salary doubles, you get a big office, you can possibly a chauffeur if you're an important minister. It's a life-changing process, but it's all in the hands of the government. So the very people on whom I depend if I want to be promoted, the very people on whom I must you know, offer everything if I want to be advanced in politics are the same people I'm supposed to be holding to account. So necessarily, if I'm an ambitious politician and I want to go up the slippery pole, the very last thing I'm going to do is my job, the one thing I'm paid to do. And unfortunately, that is what characterizes, in my view, Parliament today. You look at the number of people in Parliament on the back benches who actually hold the government to account. How do you do that? You can talk in Parliament, you can have debates. Most of that, if we're honest about it, is just theatre. The one thing you have that no one else has is a vote. So I have no more power in Richmond or North Kingston, which I represent, than any of you. you know, I'm not a glorified councillor. I can't make planning decisions. I can't make tax decisions. There's nothing I can do that you can't do in that area other than make a bit of noise. But I do have a vote in Parliament. And that's the only tool I've got as an MP. And if I'm not willing to use that in a threatening way, if, I'm not, if, if, if it is not clear to the government, to my party, that I am willing to use that vote to hold them to account, to ensure that their policy is the best possible policy, that their legislation is thoroughly scrutinized and the best possible legislation, then I may as well be replaced by a laptop computer programmed to vote with the government and just become, like so many people in Parliament, just basic lobby fodder. So that's one reason why I think Parliament and our democracy is dysfunctional. There's virtually no scrutiny at all. And if you look at the process of a bill, you know, it's a, um, I have a bill going through it, and I say going through, it's not going to go anywhere, it looks like anyone is supported, but, but let's imagine it's a very positive bill, a very popular bill. I have a bill uh, going through at the moment on, on local referendums and so on. It's at the second reading, which, which is really just publishing. If anyone can get to the second reading. If I wanted to go beyond that, it has to go through Parliament. It has to go to, a, a, assuming it gets through Parliament, it then has to go to a committee stage. Now that committee stage is made up of 23, 24, I forget the number, but around that number of MPs. Those MPs are selected by the whips. Their job is to sit in that room and, and go through the legislation line by line, to apply line by line scrutiny. And at the end of it, you have, theoretically, a better piece of legislation. The reality is that the whips choose people who have zero interest in that piece of legislation. So if you're interested, for example, in NHS, if that's your number one concern, you're the very worst person, the last person the whips are going to put on a bill scrutinizing NHS reform legislation. Because you might be a pest. You might actually have a few ideas. You might amend things. You might vote against something that the government wants you to do. So any of you can go and watch this process at any time. And you sit at the back and you watch. And I guarantee that if you watch it, that the vast majority of those 23 MPs, probably all but four, it's usually the minister, shadow minister, and their aides. Everyone else will be sitting there doing their constituency uh, uh, correspondence, Christmas cards if it's December. They will be paying no attention at all <coughs> to the issue being debated. And then when someone says vote, they stand up and vote. They have no idea what they're voting for, sit back down and carry on doing their legislation. That is the only time you have proper scrutiny of legislation. It's one of the reasons why we have such bad legislation, why we have so many mistakes. If it wasn't for the laws, which despite the problems associated with the laws, and there are problems, if it wasn't for the laws, we would have no scrutiny at all. We just have legislation rushing through Parliament, mistake after mistake after mistake, and we'd spend our entire time cleaning up years later the mistakes that we've made in our haste before. So it is a really shabby system, in my view. But it goes even beyond that, because it's not just the case that the, the parliamentarians aren't, on the whole, doing their job. There are a few notable exceptions. But it's not just that. It's also the case that the voters have almost no hold over their MP once their MP has been elected. So I, for example, could have, the day after I was elected, I could have said, you know what, you've elected me as a Conservative, but I'm going to join the BNP. There's nothing anyone locally could have done about it. Not one person voted BNP in my constituency because there was, no, there was no candidate. But I could nevertheless do that. The only thing my constituents could do, other than making a lot of noise about it, is hang their heads in embarrassment that for the next five years they're represented by someone that not one person voted for in the constituents. They wouldn't have broken a single rule, wouldn't have even broken the voluntary code that I signed as an MP the day after I became an MP. Or I could have decided I'm going to go to the Bahamas for five years and just you know, leave it all in the hands of my brilliant researcher in Richmond. Or, or even not, just tell my constituents to get stuck. I could easily have said, I'm not going to answer any of the letters, I'm not going to have any surgeries, I'm not going to talk to you, and I'm not going to step foot in my constituency, I'm going to be on a beach in the Bahamas, and that's it. And you can boot me out in five years' time. 
I wouldn't have broken a single rule governing an MP today. Now, it doesn't often happen now. I can't think of any examples. But there, you know, it's, not, it's not unrealistic to imagine an MP not holding surgeries. There are plenty of MPs who do no surgeries. So it's not unrealistic to imagine an MP not turning up to Parliament and voting. And Gordon Brown is a good example. I've been an MP now for two and a half, three years. I've only seen him twice. I'm sure he's been there more, but I've only seen him twice. I've only heard him speak twice. Uh, uh, one of them was the most extraordinary rant, uh, and the other one um, was just mind-numbingly boring. I can't remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but it was something not particularly, well, I'm sure it was very important at the time, but inside, it hasn't stuck in my mind. Um, but, but that's it. Uh, and there's nothing his constituents can do about it until the next election comes around. And that, even that, you know, it's fine in a marginal seat. Yes, you have to wait five years, you've got the embarrassment of a bad MP, and you can boot them out. But how do you boot your MP up? You've got a conservative group over there, yes? You're the conservative association here. So in your constituency, imagine you are represented by a, a useless conservative MP. The worst possible, never turns up, votes on everything he said he wouldn't vote for, breaks every election promise he made. It sounds very familiar, I'm sure. Um, you could, the only way you're going to get rid of your MP is either by not voting, which is a shame, it is a, you know, it's a really important right that we all have, or by voting for a party that you don't like to boot out your MP. And I don't think you should have to do that. You know, so a tribal Labour seat, the MP, the, the, the voters should not have to vote Tory to get rid of their useless Labour MP, and vice versa. And it doesn't happen, it never happens. So if you're in a safe seat, even that five year thing becomes irrelevant. You're selected probably by five or ten, if you're lucky, 15. Uh, uh, association active members, you know, around <coughs> drinking glasses in a room and they decide you're the person who's going to represent them. You then basically have a job for life, speaking for 100,000 people, possibly running the government, possibly getting promoted, possibly becoming a cabinet, maybe even becoming prime minister. All on the back of a decision made by a tiny number of people in your association. And unless you go to jail, unless you're caught in some kind of Jimmy Savile type a scandal, you're there until you decide to step down. Unless you go to jail for more than a year, you're there until you decide to step down. So this incredibly weak hold that people have on their elected representatives. And the effect of that is that the moment you're in Parliament, the pressure from your constituents ev evaporates. It goes. If you're in a marginal seat, it's lingering in the background. But it basically evaporates until the year before the next election. And the pressure from the whips, from the party, intensifies. They're the ones that cannot be promotion. They're the ones that can blackmail you, not literally, but emotionally blackmail you into being loyal to the party as opposed to loyal to your constituents. And you have a system where, basically, there is no real scrutiny at all. So that's my rant. I've seen it firsthand. That's the way it works or should, it doesn't work. I think there are some fairly modest things that can be done to change the dynamic in Parliament. Um, I have a bill, the bill I mentioned earlier, it's called Recall. People describe it as a, as a radical bill. It's not radical. And the reason it's not radical is that it was promised by all three party leaders before the last election. All three of them in a panic of the uh, expenses scandal, all three said, we're going to bring in recall. And recall is a very simple thing. It said, interrupt me, by the way, if you want to, because I said I wouldn't speak for very Recall is a very simple thing. It says that if enough people in the constituency sign a petition, you hit a threshold, whatever the agreed threshold is, that automatically triggers a referendum. The referendum is yes or no. Do you want them to stay on as your MP or not? And if enough people, if more than half, say no, then that person's gone. You then immediately have a by-election. The beauty of that is that even in a rock-solid safe, uh, safe seat, Labour, Tory, whatever, you can boot out your MP, and then you can reselect someone from the same party, so you can have areas that are safe for parties, but never safe for the individual MPs. And what that would do is it would tell MPs, no matter how big their majority, no matter where they represent, that there is always a three-line whip in their constituency, one which will hold them to the promises they make, and if they break those promises, they have to at least go out and about in their constituency and persuade people that they were right to break that promise. At the moment, no such pressure exists. So I think recall would have a massive impact. I think it would in ensure that we have a, a, a much more independent-minded, uh, feisty set of backbenchers who are genuinely willing to hold the government to account. Even the ambitious ones, the ones who want to go up the greasy pole, would recognize that if they do so, they've got to be mindful all the time of the people who sent them there. If they get it wrong, if they break that contract, they can lose their job at any time. I say it's not radical. One, because it wasn't in, it was in all the manifestos. Two, because it happens all over the world. There are 19 states in America that have recall, pure recall. There are others that have variations of it. There are provinces in Canada that have recall. Taiwan has recall. South Korea has recall. Switzerland has it in every canton. The recall <coughs> happens all over the world. And there's not one example that I can think of. You're probably about to prove me wrong, but there's not one example that I can think of of where recall has been abused. 
by opposition, by vexatious campaigners, by unions, or whatever. You've got an example. Scott Chris. Walker in Wisconsin. Was that? Scott Walker in Wisconsin. You have to tell me. You have to tell me. Um, and it failed. It failed. Yeah, it failed. Yeah, but the, yeah, but the, the unions, the, the opposition, attempted to recall him. Yeah, but they attempted to. That's the point. They failed. But it came close to. Well, it, it, and it, it wasted, failed. And it wasted well, taxpayer money. That is, but the taxpayers themselves initiated the recall. But in Wisconsin, they've got slightly different rules, and it relates to money. I'll come back to that in a second. But the fact is, it failed. So California, for example, there have been every governor, every single governor in California, has faced a recall attempt. Every single one, including Ronald Reagan, Jerry Brown, all the way back. Only one of them has successfully been recalled, and that was Gray Davis, who was replaced by Schwarzenegger. The Wisconsin one failed. There have been 24 attempts in um, uh, British Columbia, 24 attempts. Only 23 hit the the other way around. Only one of the 24. So 23 didn't even meet the threshold. One hit the threshold, they then had the referendum and it failed. The point is it's very, very hard to abuse. You take my constituency, for example, where the Lib Dems, very feisty bunch, very aggressive, very dirty campaigners, really unpleasant bunch as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned. Very, really unpleasant. And will do anything, anything at all to get elected. Um, but they've only got 900 members. So if you had a threshold set at 20%, for example, which is about the average, it's more or less what most people think from that money what people. 20% would require about 17, 18,000 people in my constituency to sign a petition saying that I should be recalled. That's a major challenge. And if 17,000 people, I don't care whether they're whipped up by the Labour Party, the Lib Dems, or a union, if 17,000 of my constituents signed a petition saying that I should be recalled, I couldn't dismiss that as vexatious. I'd have to take that very, very seriously. And in any case, I'd then have a chance, a two or three months chance, to persuade people that they shouldn't have signed it and that they shouldn't vote me out. Very hard. But does that not put you in constant campaigning mode rather than concentrating on governing and legislating? But, but it only puts you in constant campaign mode if they keep hitting the threshold. And I would say that if you're an MP who, where the threshold is reached, even once, you're in trouble. It shouldn't be reached. I mean, I, I would be appalled if 70, I'm sure there are more than 17,000 people who long for the next election to get me to get rid of it, if it you know, to boot me out and vote the down or whatever it is they decide to vote. But, but to do that on the basis of recall, which implies that the MP has really screwed up, is a completely different matter, which is why it never happens. It's very, very rare. The fact of recall, the moment you have recall in place, that in and of itself improves the quality of MPs because it keeps them on their toes. They behave better because they know that if they don't, they're going to get booted out. Very, very, I mean, you, there are, I'm sure there are hundreds of examples of vexatious attempts at recall, but I don't think you can think of a single example where it succeeded, on, where people would generally agree, or even a large minority would agree, it was vexatious. I can't think of a single example. And I have, you know, I've had this debate with many, many constitutional experts, recall experts, opponents in Parliament, not just parliamentarians, but most parliamentarians are opponents of recall for obvious reasons. But there are plenty of people who have studied this. I haven't yet seen a single example. In fact, there was an invitation put out by the Standards and Privilege, Privileges Committee for examples of abuse of recall. And not one example was provided, not even in countries like Taiwan and South Korea and so on. And in many of those countries, and in particular in the United States, you've got a money problem. You know, there are no limits on how much can be spent. So you know, in, in the States now, an election costs hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And you've got, I think that is a problem. Direct democracy, which includes recall and local referendums and all the rest of it, is meant to be about power to people. But it's become more and more power to big business because it costs so much. So if you want to change the casino laws, for example, you hire a big PR firm and do lots of lobbying. And it's possible to swing the vote your way, for example. That's not direct democracy. It's a perversion of direct democracy. But there are very few examples, there are no examples, as far as I'm aware, of successful abuse. And if you look in this country, where we've never had recall, we had, um, you remember in Winchester in 1997, I believe it was 1997, where Mark Oden was elected MP on a majority of two. And they counted it over and over again, and it always hovered around the two, but he always had a majority, and they settled on two. And the Tories were so upset about this, Mark Oden being a Lib Dem, that they issued a judicial challenge, and they succeeded. And they, had a, they won the right to have the vote cast again. And it was two or three months later, people voted, or how long, I don't know, a few weeks later, they voted again. And instead of having a majority of two, Mark Oden increased his majority to 22,000. And it's because people were pissed off, they didn't like time wasters. It was obviously a vexation campaign. It was a vexatious campaign. It was obviously an attempt by a, a, a sore loser team to try and reclaim the advantage. People didn't like it. They just don't like time wasting. So I think ultimately you've just got to trust. You know, you, you've got to make a decision. It's really, you know, do you trust democracy or not? You know, do you trust the mob or not? And I have spent enough time in Parliament 
wandering around the corridors and hearing people spouting all kinds of nonsense in the chamber to know that parliamentarians do not have a monopoly on good ideas or common sense. They just don't. And I think ultimately someone's got to be able to hold that, that bailout uh, cord. I prefer it was 80,000 relatively uncorruptible constituents rather than a few people in my party applying the whip or a few media uh, uh, barons. I was, I'm going to invite other discussions rather than carry on, with, carry on with my rant, which is getting deeper and deeper and wilder and wilder. Does anyone else want to ch ch check in? Okay, I'll carry on with my rant in my case. Um, it's a, um, no, I, I mean, the, the recall thing, the, 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 the Clegg is supposed to be introducing this anyway, um, and he has produced a draft bill, and it's called the recall. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, you've seen it. So it is, it is there, it's on the books, and, and he's now deciding what he's going to do with it. But it's not actually recall. If you read it, it's the opposite of recall. It's called recall, but it's the opposite of recall. Because his idea is because he's basically very frightened of voters, um, as all the Lib Dems are at the moment, because of their experience with, um, maybe not up to last night, but up to their experience with the tuition fee um, issue, where they really felt bruised, and they all felt that if recall existed, they'd probably get recalled. So they've been really cut off the idea of recall. So they put something in place which has all kinds of protections against voters. Um, uh, and the key one being that instead of handing power down to people, to voters, it hands power up to a parliamentary committee. And that committee alone decides whether or not an MP merits recall. And I think that's incredibly sinister and incredibly dangerous. And I know that if I was an obedient, a good, and useful MP, as far as my party's concerned, no matter what complaints are brought forward, a committee is basically going to protect me because it's going to be a whip dominated committee, like all the committees. And they're probably going to kind of err on the side of, well, let's keep them in. Basically, useful is one of us. But if you're a maverick MP, say so George Galloway, I can't stand George Galloway, but he's got a democratic mandate. He was voted in. You know, he speaks for the people he represents, and it was an extraordinary result. Someone like that wouldn't survive under any circumstances in a committee of that sort. So this is a mechanism actually that, that, that really empowers the party, empowers the whips, and makes it much easier to get rid of the maverick or the slightly dangerous MPs. And I think that's a problem. I don't think Parliament should have any say in this at all. Is that perceived as less radical because it's sort of more advantageous for MPs? Yeah, but MPs are supposed to look at that and think, okay, that will protect us, I'm not too worried, we don't have to worry about the mob. But I think actually like the opposite effect because the, it, it, it does, um, the process is, is quite different to the one that, that I described. And the one that I described is not my idea, I mean, it's what happens all over the world. So mine would be a petition up to say 20,000, sorry, 20% 20 of the, of the electorate. The moment you get over that threshold, you have a referendum, yes or no. If you fail that hurdle and you boot it out, you then have a by-election. You can stand again if you want to be. Your party's not going to select you. And that's it. Under the government's plan, you have anyone can complain, even if they're not a constituent. Anyone can complain about an MP. That MP's case then has to be looked at by the committee. The committee then decides, should they be recalled, yes or no. If the answer is yes, that merits a recall. You immediately then have a by-election. And it's an extraordinary... I missed the stage. You have to collect 10% of the signatures, and then you have a by-election. But the point of that is that if you get through that, so if you are identified, if the committee decides you should be recalled, uh, at that point, you would then have to persuade 90% of your constituents not to sign the petition. Very, very uh, difficult task for any MP, no matter how popular they are. And if you fail to do that, which I think you probably would, I think all MPs have failed to do that, you're immediately then in a by-election, where you're fighting to remain an MP, but not on the basis of what you were accused of initially, but within the national context, it becomes like any other violation. So if your party's not doing well, you're not going to do well. If your party is doing well, you might do well. It's a completely skewered process. There's no opportunity for the individual MP to defend themselves or explain, this is a vexatious campaign, you know, this, is a, this is something you should reject. It's a very, very odd system. Fortunately, no one in Parliament supports it because it's too complicated and it doesn't seem to provide the kind of protections that the Lib Dems wanted to provide. So I think it's just going to get dropped. I'd be amazed if we had a vote on recall. Well, I'm going to try and force a vote on my one, but I don't think we'll have a vote on the government's recall this side of the election. I just think it'll happen. And then there'll be another scandal. And it won't just be a Renault type sex scandal with an individual MP caught you know, with their fingers in the till or whatever it is. You'll have a more systemic problem like we had with expenses, and then they'll all run its recall again. But the trouble is, unless voters are interested in this issue, unless voters know what it is they need to be asking of their parliament in order to make it more responsive and accountable. Politicians will always come up with ludicrous solutions. And you remember the last election, Hazel Bleers was asked by voter turnout, 
and asked about party membership and why was it all going down so low? Why were we breaking records every election? And she said, well, it's apathy. And, and her idea, her solution, was that uh, first-time voters should be given free iPods and that old people should be given warm donuts. And that would encourage people to vote. The assumption being that we're all apathetic. Well, we're not apathetic. We cannot describe this country as apathetic. We're highly political. In a million, up to two million, depending on who you listen to, march against the war in Iraq. Half a million march against the ban on hunting. You know, tens of millions of people sign up to pressure groups every year, renew their membership. We are not an apathetic country. People just don't like the way we do politics. They feel that politicians are remote. They feel the system is remote. And it is remote. They're right. So that's, in a sense, politicians have not um, succeeded in genuinely, authentically addressing the problems that's led to this kind of breakdown of trust and faith between, you know, the relationship between people in power. Yeah. Um, on this theme, what are your views on public primaries? Like, was used to select someone like Sarah Wilson? Mm. I think that's really important. It's almost as important as recall. I would say recall is the biggest reform, the one that would make people feel empowered because it would genuinely empower them. Um, but open primaries are really cool. I mean, it, Sarah Williston is a really good example. I'm talking about the, and the, the um, NHS reports. You know, she put herself, this is a new MP, Tottenham's Tory, ele selected in an open primary. She came into Parliament knowing that she wasn't parachuted in, knowing that she wasn't the favourite of number 10, or whatever it was before we won the election, um, the central office. She knew that she had a local mandate. She knew that, that, that a very large number of people had selected her and then elected her. And she came in with a real, you know, independent spirit, and, um, and she has proven to be an independent and useful MP since. And actually, she tried to put herself forward to go on the NHS bill, but she's a doctor, she's one of the most qualified people in the party when it comes to NHS type issues, precisely because she knew what she was talking about. It's a classic example. So I think you need open primaries, 100% I'd make them mandatory, across the board, also for councillors, loads of useless councillors, some very good ones as well. Um, I think you need to have recall, and I think you need to have more elections within Parliament itself. So the committees I talked about earlier, the scrutiny committees, they shouldn't be uh, created by the winners. There should be a mechanism. I should be able to put myself forward and say, you know, this is an issue I, uh, I know something about, and I want to be on the committee, I'm going to scrutinise it, and if my colleagues agree with me, then I'll end up on the committee. And yes, that will slow things down, but that's not a bad thing when we're churning out party much legislation, and most of it's rubbish in any case. It is uh, probably quite good to slow it down and, and, and apply much more scrutiny. So there are lots of things we need to do. I'm not pretending recall is the answer, but it's a very big answer, I think. And as an MP, I would find it empowering. If recall existed, I would know the next time the mirror or the mayor or the express or whoever it else is says to me, you know, you're a useless MP, you don't do this or you don't do that, or you don't listen, or you know, he's actually chucked out for saying this or voting in or whatever it is, I would be able to answer. Under a regime of recall, I'd be able to say, well, prove it. You know, if I'm really that useless, Get rid of me, recall me, you can do it at any time. You could turf me out within a few weeks, easy. And the fact that it doesn't happen gives you a kind of implied mandate. And I think that would embolden MPs to take a much more robust approach than they do at the moment. So I think it would be a good thing. I think MPs walk around with a chip on their shoulder at the moment, kind of feeling that they shouldn't really be there. They kind of cheated the system to get there. You know, they, 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 haven't done, they haven't had to go through a particularly rigorous process to be selected. And if they're in a safe seat, well, even less so. So I think it would be a really important thing for MPs as well. Yeah, do you still want to ask a question? Yeah, I want to ask the thing the tangential one. Got Going back I regret to pointing to now. <laughs> Sorry? I regret pointing to now. Yeah, right. It's a killer on no, I was just thinking about what you said about your maiden speech, because Neil Hamilton, who's been on television quite a lot, a great friend of mine, I appreciate at his wedding, uh, didn't actually make a maiden speech, he made a maiden interruption. Michael Foote was um, leader of the opposition when Mrs. Thatcher was re-elected to the second time. Yeah. And said in PMQs, would the right honourable lady kindly inform the House how many people have lost their jobs since the government was returned to power? And he shoved out to the back benches, well, you had making for a start. Yeah. And there was mayhem in the chamber with the court in Hansard. But referring to what's happened this morning, sorry, That's right. being reported this morning, there was a recent article about John Gray who wrote Straw Drops, which I don't believe is the screenplay. I think it's a book about the, not the next of the progress. And said that the current Prime Minister, together with, um, with um, Tony Blair, were not men of ideas. They merely believed in progress or modernization for the sake of modernization. Mm -hmm. As a result of which Tony Blair lost his corvette and evidently yesterday in Eastleigh, 
the Tories did as well. Do you think that uh, David Cameron has ideas, or is it progress for the sake of progress? Well, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't think, uh, I think progress for the sake of progress is an idea. Um, I don't know when I endorse or support, but I think it is an idea. Uh, I think it's a flawed idea, but it is the dominant idea. I think most people believe in progress for the sake of progress. If we can do something, we must do it. The idea that you might want to stop in advance uh, of a particular technology is an anathema. Most people regard you as a Luddite. So I'm hostile to GM food, not because I don't think there's some application of GM food, but because I think the market has rushed way ahead of the science, and I don't trust the scientists, and I don't trust the regulators. And I've seen enough examples of corruption of our regulatory system to know that the revolving door is swinging off its hinges. So I, 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 in that sense, I'm a Luddite. I'm against progress for the sake of progress. I think we're abusing antibiotics to the point where 10 years' time, your children probably will live in a post-antibiotic age, which is a terrifying thought. Our politicians couldn't give a shit. I've had a debate on this. I'm the only person to have debated this in Parliament. It took me a year to get the debate. Finally had it, spoke to a health minister, very good health minister, who never considered this, never considered it, despite the fact that it is our number one health concern. By far. Can you imagine having a hip operation with no antibiotics? It's not possible. So we are entering a very difficult time. So I, am not, I do not sign up to the idea of progress for the sake of progress. I do not trust uh, uh, the decision makers in, or our regulatory system in relation to these kinds of devices. But it is still an idea, a mad idea, but it's still an idea. So does David Cameron have ideas? Yeah, he has ideas. But I, I think that what happened last night um, in Eastleigh is a different point, I think, to the one. I'm answering, I'm answering your question with two answers, two quite distinct answers. But I think what happened there is that the people of Eastley, they were not attracted, in my view, to particular ideas. It wasn't that you could take a skeptic position. It wasn't about immigration. It wasn't about tax or whatever the issues were that were being discussed by UKIP in Eastleigh. As far as I'm, you know, if I had to guess, I wasn't there, I'm not a political expert, but I, my guess is that it wasn't about these particular ideas. Because I reckon that David Cameron could have made all the UKIP promises a month ago. I did promise to a referendum in Europe. He could have made other promises in relation to other aspects of the UKIP agenda. And I don't think it would have made any difference at all to the outcome. I think the reason people voted UKIP is because there is a disgust which is directed at the political classes in our country. There's a sense that not one of our three main political parties have any kind of authenticity at all. And I would sign up to that. I think the Conservative Party lacks authenticity. I think the Labour Party lacks it. And I think the Liberal Democrats, even more so, lack authenticity. And I think that's a problem. And so when you have a sort of choice between three parties, which are mildly different, and in some cases even you know, significantly different, Europe's a good example of where there are genuine differences, you have to believe that party in order to invest your vote with them, in order to vote them into power. And I don't think people do believe them. I don't think, I think there is a crisis in our politics. People do not trust the Conservative Party. They don't trust the Labour Party, and they don't trust the Lib Dems. And when we go out knocking on doors, and when you look, go out and help whoever it is you're helping, whatever constituency you belong to, and knock on doors, I think you'll find, when you say, well, our manifesto is promising this, this, and this, and here are the ten things we're going to do, I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of those people don't laugh at you. Manifesto. I mean, it means absolutely nothing nowadays. You know, there are, I remember the promises I made before the election based on the Conservative manifesto. I still make those promises. I, the things that I promised that I would do before the election are things that I continue to campaign on. But whereas I was in step with my party before the election, I'm completely out of step with my party now. Localism, local democracy, local referendums, recall, environment, these kinds of issues, we're miles apart now, me and my party. And I haven't moved, the party's moved. And that's because manifestos increasingly mean virtually nothing. You wouldn't wipe your bum on a political party manifesto nowadays, because it's just not worth it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, bringing it back to um, recall, you were talking about um, how lots of states in America have recall. And, I mean, if you look at American politics, it's not exactly the most bipartisan thing out there. So, if, even if we did have recall, why do you think that it would have enough of an impact that it would reduce the extent to which people just took party line? But, but I think the problem in America, it kind of goes back to the point I was making earlier about the money, I think it's very easy to buy political influence in America, much more so than it is in this country. You know, the limits are there. Um, it, it's, it's quite hard to abuse the system here from a financial point of view. I mean, I was accused of, of spending too much on my election campaign in, in Richmond. And the, the, the source of contention with you know, jackets that cost £1.50 <coughs> each, about 20 of them. And, and in America, you wouldn't even notice that. You know, 20 jackets, that's £30. Or it's, it's, it's a... Um, it's very hard, I think, to, to, to really, in an impactful way, corrupt the system financially 
in this country. There are all kinds of other ways of corrupting it, but I don't think that, politically, I don't think that, that is the main threat. Whereas in the states, an election, even at a very local level, or if it's a referendum, as in the case of California, recently they had the place on procedural legislation or something recently, um, I think it, it, you, these things don't tend to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. And at that point, it's, it's not really about direct democracy, it's not really about recall. So it doesn't really have the impact that recall could have if it was brought into this country. If it was brought into this country, it would just be a permanent reminder to tell MPs all the time that they cannot casually break their promises. Yes, they can break a few, but if the, you know, there comes a point where you've broken too many promises and your electorate gets sick of you, and you no longer represent them, and you made five promises before the election, you've broken four of them, and they're not going to wait for you to break the fifth one, they're going to boot you out. And I think it just, it, you know, it's not that MPs will never lie again, they'll never break election promises, or they never perform u turns but they do it knowing that they have to answer questions locally. So imagine the tuition fee business, for example. There are Lib Dems who, um, who were forced into a U-turn very uncomfortably. They probably still would have voted against, uh, in favor of the uh, tuition fees, but they would have had to go around their constituency and ask and answer as many questions as people were willing to raise. And they would have really been held to account. Over it. They might have been able to persuade people, we've had no choice, if we've got a crisis in this country, if we've done it for this reason or that reason, Here's why we've done a U-turn. Here's why we think it's the right decision. Yes, it's a complete flip on what we said before the election, but there's a reason for that. And probably they'd have got away with it. Probably. But it's people, broadly speaking, are quite forgiving as long as they feel that the, the issue, the, system, the, the process is transparent. But they would have had to do it. Whereas under today's rules, most of those MPs just went into a bunker. They just said, look, we're going to wait. Wait till, till, till the storm passes and hope we get away with it in the next election, by which time they will get away with it, because it'll be four or five years <coughs> people have moved on to different issues at that point. So that, that accountability is not today. But you get to, I think, at least begin to build that bridge between people and power by bringing in something that we call. But it will, it's not the only answer, it is an answer. I think. Yeah. Oh, yes, uh, you've spoken about breaking promises and that politicians break their promises, but don't the general public basically have to recognise that in the real world, circumstances will always change. Circumstances today aren't the same as they were in 2010 at the election, but always throughout history in you know, any kind of democratic system, uh, or in any kind of political system, you yeah. cannot implement exactly what they have promised. And that's just common sense. Yeah. But you can offer a, a direction of travel. So if you, for example, talk about localism, because you believe in localism, so you might have 10 or 15 policies that are localist. And you might find that after the election, not all of those 15 prom uh, mechanisms that you identified before the election are practical. And you might find there's a better way around it. There might be a different solution to the same problem. But at least you have the same kind of basic direction of travel. What I don't think is acceptable is to say that we believe in X, and this is what we're going to do, and we're going to find the right policies to deliver X, whatever X happens to be. And then after an election, say, actually, we're bored of X, we're going we're to go for Y, and Y happens to be the direct opposite of X. I don't think that's acceptable. Yes, the individual policies or the, the solutions that politicians, you know, once you become a government and you have access to the civil service, you've got access to resources you don't have before in opposition. No opposition party has ever developed a complete manifesto, a complete set of answers to the world's, to the country's problems. And it is necessarily the case that after getting in, they're going to fine tune that, they're going to find alternatives. And I think that's acceptable. But there's a basic thread of honesty there, which I think people are right and entitled to expect. When circumstances really change, you know, of course, I, but I think people understand that. And if you have a, a spending commitment, which you make in a time of, of, of plenty, and you enter a period that we have today, then people understand that you can't, I mean, can't honour that promise. But you've got to explain why. There has to be a rationale, there has to be a reason. We've broken promises, the coalition government. Both parties blame it on the coalition, obviously. Recall's a good example of that. Nothing to do with recall, nothing to do with, sorry, nothing to do with the coalition, nothing to do with the economy. There was no rational excuse for not bringing in something like recall, something that they thought was such a good idea before the election. Nothing has changed that is relevant to recall that would justify a decision to scrap that particular part. It's a small example, but there are many, many of these examples. And I think that's where the voters are entitled to get very close. It's not about the circumstances changing. It's about people's opinions changing. It's about promising things in order to be elected and then hoping you can get away with dropping them after the election. And that has characterized British politics for years. It's not, it's not a conservative party problem, it's, it's a, it is a, a political problem. The same case for a lot of presumably conservative voters that feel disenfranchised and don't know what the coalition is doing, so they're going to vote UKIP. We haven't repealed the Human Rights Act, or we haven't 
that would have to go to Paris and Brussels. Do you want to give a quite a of irrationality in that, as with the coalition and with the election result, it is physically impossible to do those things. That seems to be a very large number of people who simply refuse. Well, it's not to impossible to do that. It's not impossible to do those things. I mean, you know, we, we have, um, the Parliament is still technically sovereign. We can still make decisions. As I mean, there's not, there's not a majority in Parliament for appealing the Human Rights Act. Yeah, but, 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 yeah but, then, but exactly right. But then it's our job. I mean, there is a sense, I think, that people don't believe that even if we weren't in a, a coalition, coalition government that we still wouldn't deliver those things because it's hard work. Delivering a lot of those promises are going to be incredibly difficult, whoever's in power. And I don't think people don't you could, you could expect in UKIP to implement those solutions. That's not really why, it's why you know, people don't vote green thinking they're going to get a green government. They vote in order to try and up the ante on their particular cause and put pressure and it'll work. So the, 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 the near success of UKIP yesterday, there were no UKIP MPs, but it will have an impact on the debate in Parliament, without a doubt. I mean, it's hard to predict what that impact's going to be, actually. But, but without a doubt, it has changed the political landscape. You know, when Caroline Lucas, a Green MP, was elected, that changed things. There is now a Green voice in Parliament. I mean, as it happens, the Green Party isn't just a Green Party. I mean, if you look at their entire suite of, 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 of um, policies, they're, they're almost Trotskyite in, in many respects. But, but, but I think that matters. I mean, she's not in government. She's not making these decisions. But the fact there is a Green MP there, I think is a good thing. I was thrilled that she got elected because I think it, it raises the general uh, level of debate on green issues in Parliament, which is an area that, that we've always been miles behind in. So I, I don't think people vote UKIP thinking they're going to get a UKIP government or that these policies are going to go through, but they do vote for them thinking, you know, this is not just a protest vote. This, this, is, this is telling the government that I want them to do things that they're not currently doing and I want them to clean up their act. So I, it's all I mean, who. Who knows why the each and individual voter casts the vote they do, but I suspect that's what it is. And what happened last night makes it very much harder for us to say it's a waste of vote voting UK. That's a challenge for the Conservative Party now, because a month ago, you know, they, were, they were nowhere in the polls in East and suddenly they came from behind and had there been another week of campaigning, they could easily have won it. If they had the local organisation of the Conservatives that would have done it, they probably would have won it. So the, the dynamic, for sure, has been different. It's changed. And just coming back to what you were saying about whips, do you, do you think we should not have whips at all? Yeah. No, I, I, I think whips are really important. I get on very well with the whips, weirdly. But I do, I mean, they, 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 they're very clever at selecting the nicest people to be whips on the so that they, um, because they don't actually have a whip. They, they, they have to try and charm you into, 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 into taking a particular decision. We've got some nice people as whips. You know, my, my whip is Joe Johnson, with Boris's brother. He's a very good guy, he's a friend. Um, and I feel very bad whenever I rebel now. So I, I, I have to <laughs> apologize for him, but, but remember all the time the reason I'm doing it. Um, so it's, it's not a, um, but he has an important job, and the whole, you know, all, all the whips, their, their job is to get the government program through. I don't want a, para a paralyzed government. I don't want a government that can't get its program through. Otherwise, we just end up in a sort of quite nothing happens. So the whip's job is to try and discipline the party and get legislation through, to get the government program through. Our job as backbenchers, as people who are not on the payroll in that sense, our job is to resist that pressure. Not all the time, but we need to, then if you don't have a resistance there, then the government can take its party's votes for granted. And that, I think, is a very dangerous situation. So I'm always accused by, by not always accused, occasionally accused of being disloyal because I vote against the party from time to time. But if you look at my record, and in, in terms of the rankings, I would be, I'd be one of the rebellious people in the party. But if you look at my voting record, I voted 91-ish percent of the time in favor of my party, my default position. So I regard that as a kind of a, as a pretty a pretty loyal record. But the fact that I have been willing to use my vote against my party tells them that they've got to work that little bit harder to ensure that I'm on side with whatever issue it is. And I think that's important. I think it's a good thing for democracy. I think it's a good thing for legislation. But I've never resented the whips. I think the whips do a really important job. You need the whips. But we need to show a bit of backbone. And that's the problem. It's not about weakening the whip. It is about strengthening parliament. And that's why you need things like the primary, recall, etc., etc., to strengthen parliament. Um, my, my question is twofold. You mentioned earlier about your um, that people have you know, criticised you for, for for how much you spent on your own campaign. What what do you think about these criticisms? And then, and second of all, what would you think about um, a generally agreed budget across all parties in terms of people maintaining faith in in you know, the government in general? Um, I don't believe in state funding of the parties. I don't. I think that would be a, the wrong thing to do. I think that um, um, when you look at the Obama campaign which I'm not the second one first, but if, 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 I will answer your first question. So if you look at his, um, his kind of social media campaign, 
there are probably more people, I think, probably, I think it is a case that more people, more individual people, funded his campaign than any other political campaign in history. I think that's the case. Maybe you're going to tell me why. No. But, but I think, <laughs> I think that's, I've read that in the magazine <laughs> somewhere. Um, and I think it probably is true. I think that must be true. Uh, and it, it sounds plausible. But even if it's not true, it's nearly true. Very many people funded his. He wasn't reliant on three or four big businesses. It was a much broader uh, uh, support base he had. And it was a very clever campaign that he ran on that basis. So I think in the modern era with internet and so on, politicians ought to be able to inspire support from many more people. So I'd be quite comfortable seeing a, a very, very tight limit on what an individual or an individual business can provide. I'd be very happy with that. So, and, and immediately you probably have a reduction in the overall budget, but that would compel parties to reach out and they don't reach out at the moment. So, I think that's probably a good thing to do. <coughs> Sorry. This is yesterday's smoking. It's coming back to all <laughs> um, Give me one second. And um, <coughs> so I would, I would leave it to... <coughs> my voice is gone. Would you like some water? No, it'll come back in two seconds. <coughs> Unless anyone's got a cigarette they can give me. <laughs> 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 So I'd reduce, the, I'd reduce the, the, the size of an individual donation. I think that would, <coughs> would probably do a good thing. Um, but there are already limits in constituency, and it's quite tight. You have two different election periods. You have the early election and the long election, or maybe the other way around. But you've got two parts of an election, which spreads over about three months, or however long the election period is. And it's quite tight, and we're all the same. And it's not such a high threshold that a candidate any candidate ought to be able to reach that, reach that threshold. They ought to be able to raise enough money to run the campaign up to the limit of what is allowed in that three-month period if they have enough support. And you don't need to have lots of very rich backers in order to do that. So it's quite a good level playing field already from that point of view. What happened to me in the criticism was legitimate, but it was, there was, um, I had, uh, we had allocated some of the long election costs in the short period and some of the short people period in the long bit. The net amount of money was within the limit. I mean, easily within the limits, but it had been allocated for them. So I would argue that it makes no difference at all, that it's bureaucratic, so it, it's meaningless in real terms. Um, but it was, it was uh, in fact, I was, I, was, I was told even it wasn't even illegal. But had it been illegal, I would still say it was meaningless. So it's not something, it's not, a, <coughs> it's not any, uh, anything that, that was particularly embarrassing. Or, or um, what was embarrassing was my reaction to it when I did an interview with Jon Snow. And I ended up losing my temper, which you must never do in an interview. Because I was annoyed at such a big deal it was being made of something which was so routine. And I guarantee that the same kind of problems with, with allocation of budgets would have applied in every single constituency around the country, without exception. And I was annoyed that they were kind of inflating the importance of this, because it wasn't. They were kind of implying that there was corruption there or cheating or something. And I don't think anyone, if you look at the figures, could have reached that same conclusion. You could have put it and none of spoke for themselves. So I was annoyed, but I shouldn't have been. But the actual the criticism is it's legitimate. If you're told you know, that your politician has overspent in one part of the election, given the hatred that most people have for politicians, you can't not expect some kind of scrutiny to come back. So I think it's all part of the part of the course. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi there. Uh, as I was talking to you in Wikipedia before, before I came here, I noticed you. you were, uh, <laughs> I missed the first part. So what was that? <laughs> I just said as I was talking to you in Wikipedia before I came, uh, I noticed that you're an environmental activist. So I wanted to ask you a question about that. Uh, why? Why do people uh, dislike uh, your uh, your leadership of your party, George Osborne and uh, and friends? Why do they do things like? Uh, give green light to developing of shale gas in the UK. Is that just uh, being stupid, or corrupt, or both? I mean, shale's a difficult issue, actually. Because it's, it's, I mean, genuinely, there are lots of other examples that I think you could legitimately use. Um, I think what's happened is, um, I think that the Treasury hasn't, um, it only interprets environmental solutions through the prism of cost. So every, as far as it's concerned, if something is green, it must cost more and therefore it's bad, and therefore it's not good for the economy, and therefore we need to drop the green stuff. It's a very almost Neanderthal approach that the, the Treasury has. And yes, there are some green policies which knock up costs, no doubt about it, but we're in a different world today. So the solutions that I would have been talking about five or six years ago are not necessarily the same ones I've been talking about now. This is less money, we're at the age of austerity, there's you know, all kinds of problems with the economy, which we all know about. 
Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't good green solutions, which are good for the, co the economy as well. So energy efficiency, the most obvious example, which even Margaret Thatcher, I say even Margaret Thatcher, but she was a different era, at a time when people weren't so worried about the environment. You know, she really led the way. She described it, and, uh, she did a speech, her no regrets policy, you remember? in which she talked at length about the benefits of being more efficient with our resources, particularly energy, but not just energy. That's a very, very powerful speech she gave, uh, and absolutely hit the nail on the head. But since then, conservatism has, has become more and more confused, I think, with corporatism, uh, which I think is a real mistake. I mean, a conservative should believe in an even playing field, balance of power, small businesses, opportunity, entrepreneurs, startups, and so all, our, all of our bias, all of our emphasis should be about getting the economy moving. And that's by supporting business. But I think what often happens, the kind of default position of some conservatives, uh, and this I think does characterize um, elements of the Treasury uh, today, is a kind of default position which says we're just going to take the corporate issue. We'll, you know, big business will knock on our door, we'll open it quicker than our predecessors did. You know, the, the, it's, it's a, um, you know, it's, I think it's a worrying, I think it's a worrying pheno phenomenon, and I think the effect is that not all of the policies that we're pursuing it really going to hold up to scrutiny. But there are plenty of green policies, and energy efficiency is the obvious one, but there are, there are whole sectors, and in fact, if, if, if you um, investment in, for example, solar has gone through the roof in this country, I and mean, it's a massive impact in terms of jobs created, in terms of um, economic stimuli that that has resulted in, and, I, and I, think, I think those kinds of things need to be recognized. The fact that they're green can be ignored by the Chancellor. The fact that they're contributing to our economic recovery, I think, is something that should not be ignored. I think there are all kinds of solutions there which we could be pursuing, which would have an impact in terms of the environment, also in terms of economic development, economic growth. And there are other solutions which also have an impact on cost of living, which is probably the big political issue of the day. I think when it comes to the next election, cost of living is probably going to dominate the debate, whether it's energy <coughs> or food or whatever it happens to be. I think that is really the number one issue. Well, sensible environmental policies which are about recognizing limits and being more efficient with our resources, et cetera, et cetera, ought to have an impact in terms of reducing the cost of living. If they don't, then they're probably not the right environmental policies. But having that kind of level of discussion with the, with the Treasury at the moment is almost impossible. But there are many people in the front line of the Conservative Party today, lots of people, who really do get this. They don't happen to be in the Treasury at the moment, which is a problem. Um, I have no idea what the time is. Kind of, yeah. Should we could take, um, should we take one a couple more? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, so, we have parliamentary elections less frequently than most democratic countries in the world. Do you think that five years is too long for parliament? No, I don't, I don't think five years is too long. Um, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, but, but I think that you know, five years is only too long if you've got the wrong MP. And if you've got the wrong MP, you ought to be able to get rid of it. So, it goes back to the very first point I made, which is that we should have equal. It should be possible to keep MPs on their toes, um, which it isn't at the moment. So in a context, in, in, in an age where you're not able to sack your MP, and I think it's the only job you can't, even vicars can get sacked nowadays. It's a new thing, but they can be. Um, uh, I think it's, um, I, I think five years probably in those circumstances does seem like a very long time. But this is a guaranteed job for five years. Very few people can guarantee you a job for five years, minimum, without any interference at all, without anyone asking how you're doing, without anyone holding you to account.